Welcome to another episode of AKA Ask Kevin Anything. With the recent increase in real estate prices, we have received so many questions about how the sale of the principal residence is treated for tax purposes. So we decided to make a collective Ask Kevin Anything, AKA. And our discussions with clients haven't been limited to the local area. As real estate prices have surged nationally, due to the low supply or inventory of real estate. The gain on the principal residence is generally calculated by taking the adjusted sales price minus the cost of the residence, which would include the original purchase price, plus the settlement cost incurred during its purchase, plus improvements. Improvements include the cost of any item that actually improved the home, from new roofs and HVAC systems to landscaping as opposed to general maintenance. So far, this sounds like the accounting for the sale of any other asset. Where selling a home usually differs is that each person who owned and occupied the residence for two out of the last five years gets a $250,000 exclusion. Thus, two co-owners or spouses would get exclusion of $500,000. The important thing to remember is that both co-owners must own and occupy the residence for two out of the last five years in order to get the $500,000 exclusion. If the residence is in the name of only one of the spouses, then there would only be one exclusion for $250,000. You no longer have to buy a house of equal or greater value to avoid the gain. While this replacement rule was changed over 20 years ago, somehow this old rule is still etched in the minds of taxpayers, which has to be one of the three biggest misconceptions regarding the taxation of a principal residence. The second biggest misconception is that somehow the debt owed on the property or home somehow figures into the calculation. Often I hear folks say that they had a loss on the sale of their home because they had to bring money to the settlement, although I haven't heard this lately. What usually has happened is the owners at some point refinanced and took out their equity prior to the sale. The third misconception has to do with the death of a spouse prior to the sale of the residence, which goes beyond the scope of this segment. But briefly, in this case, the surviving spouse gets only the exclusion of $250,000 for themselves. However, there would be a step up in basis for the decedent's portion. So assuming the decedent owned half of the home, his or her cost is stepped up to one half of the fair market value of the home at the time of death, which could be worth more than the $250,000 exclusion. For most taxpayers or couples, the principal residence is one of their two largest assets, and its taxation can get complicated as family dynamics and circumstances evolve. Call us today and discuss how we can help you navigate not just the taxation of principal residence, but all aspects of tax-focused financial planning. Please send us your questions. If we use one of your questions on a future segment of AKA, Ask Kevin Anything, we will give $100 to a local food pantry. Together, let's help up a family in need.